the Revisionary Podcast with your host, Juan Carlos. The Revisionary Podcast. Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Revisionary Podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Juan Carlos. So, if this is your first time listening, the way this works is we bring on guests, usually comedians, who tell a nonfiction story about their lives in which they wish things had gone a little bit differently. Afterwards, I give them an opportunity to tell the same exact story, except this time they can change any facts or details that they would like about the story. This week, I actually have the opportunity to sit down with Aaron Abelman. I've actually never met Aaron in person. This is actually going to be the first time that we've chatted. So the way this came about is uh, it was one, it was really one of those, you know, my people will reach out to your people situations. You know what I mean? Except in my case, you know, my people is just really just me. Um, so I don't I don't really have people, but he has people, which is kind of cool. So that was exciting. And, uh, you know, his assistant reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, Aaron really wants to do the podcast. He's really interested. Can we have him on? So we worked out the logistics and boom, it's going to happen. I'm excited to meet him because he seems to have a very interesting background. It seems like at some point in his life, uh, he lived in uh, Michael Douglas's basement. I think he might have been born there. So that's just an interesting start to things. Um, I know that he's an activist and he's done a lot of uh, cool stuff. He uh, he's, he's he does music as well. I know he's an actor. He's made music with people like U2 and Most Def, just to name a few. Um, and the coolest part of all is he just had a book that came out on uh, Father's Day. So check it out. The book is called Welcome to Earth, Love Letters to My Child and Practices for Families. So please go ahead and check that out. I'm really excited to, you know, pick up a copy myself and see how this goes. And honestly, I'm excited to speak to Aaron. Let's see. uh, Let's see how this goes. So without further ado, let me see if I can get Aaron on the line. Hello, Aaron. How are you? What's up? Good to be here. I am so happy that you decided to join the Revisionaries here on the Revisionary Podcast. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. So, um, before we get started, why don't you introduce yourself to the Revisionaries and tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Aaron Abelman. I'm an artivist. Uh, that means I use art for activism. And I, myself, my craft is as a storyteller at Nature. So this is really exciting to be here. I'm a, a published author and award-winning musician and spoken word artist and I've been working a lot in many different media formats more and more in film and television these days but most importantly I am my daughter's father my daughter is uh, the light of my life and really the most important contribution I think I've made to this world is is that I get to be a dad I love that that is your favorite credit of all. You're like, yeah, yeah, that other stuff is kind of cool, but whatever. Look what, what I really am as a dad. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep things in perspective because, you know, that is, that's the most important job I have right now. Right. So let me ask you this, because um, you've had like a very interesting like uh, career and stuff like that. So first off, how long have you been a dad? Let's start there because that is the most important one. Yeah, so my daughter was my daughter was born ten days after the twenty sixteen election. Uh, so it was a, a a dark day for us progressives in the world, uh, Trump's election, but a bright day for me. In yeah, my daughter was born in November twenty sixteen. So she's four, it'll be four and a half soon. And she and I, yeah, we're we um, we have an, we have the most amazing relationship. I could have ever asked for so okay so and she was born in california i assume yep in the, so you in guys the are just all oh okay all californians huh well i i should acknowledge that we live in chichino ohlone land i know that that's that's a an important practice these days to acknowledge the original peoples of the the lands that we're in so we're out we're here in uh what what is chichino ohlone land otherwise known as the bay area you know, that's the first time I've ever heard that. So you've taught me something today. That's pretty cool. Hey, that's dope. <laughs> Look at you <laughs> dropping knowledge on me. Okay. <laughs> so here's the other thing I wanted to discuss. So you have a, uh, so, you know, you mentioned, you know, your dad, you, 
you uh, you you do music. Is there uh, any music that uh, I, we might have heard of, or the audience might be familiar with? Um, so I've done some some music for. Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, I did a project with Most Deaf and Talib Kweli that that won twenty five awards. It was actually it was a a project that I I created. Um, I don't know if folks have heard of Pacha's Pajamas, but it it uh, yeah I was able to reach over a million children with it was a family family hip hop mm-hmm. story that we adapted to. There's a there's a music album, but I've also done I've done some stuff for HBO uh, and you know I've been yeah collaborated with a lot of different artists, but not nothing you know mega hit wise right of my production although life is long there's still still a chance <laughs> there's still time hold on so now uh when you when you say you're making the music right and uh and these projects are you uh composing are you producing are you rapping or do you play instruments what are you i've, I've done it all bro i i <laughs> yeah i've actually been um I, I guess it's one of the blessings and the curses of being a Renaissance person in terms of mm-hmm. passion for I, you know, my passion for storytelling really lent naturally to be to being a rapper and and doing spoken word and um, and I think great songs have great stories whether it's a love song mm-hmm. or whatever it is um, so I love that and but yeah I you know I play piano I play a bunch of different wind instruments I studied jazz trumpet in university so i'm kind of all over the place to be honest i'd ask you to spit bars but you know i'm not trying to put you on the spot like that (laughs) (laughs) i'm not gonna do that to you well actually this the story i want to i want to tell tonight i've done as a spoken word piece so i could i could kick off a little bit of the yeah but we'll we'll do that yeah we'll get to that so before we get to that you also have a book coming out right yeah i do i i Okay, um, so it's it's called Welcome to Earth, Love Letters to My Child and Practices for Families. And it's literally a collection of 365 letters I wrote every day of my daughter's first year, followed by a practice or a meditation um, for, for parents. So it's primarily for dads, but moms, I think, you know, I'm getting great early response um but we're just building a self-care wellness movement for for families and really trying to support parents especially you know in these pandemic days when everyone is so stressed and it's just a challenging time to be uh to be raising families that's pretty cool i actually tried to write a book once but i realized i only know about 380 words and like that's not enough for a novel you know what i mean (laughs) Yeah, yeah, the fact that you're hosting a podcast easily gives you the credentials to write a book. I, I think, I think everybody should write a book. By the way, that's that's the uh, the Libra in me. Is I, I want everybody to win. But it's, you know what? It's hard though. Right? I, yeah. Let me not. I, I don't want to gloss over the work because it's work. Mm-hmm. No, and look, I've always thought that you know the person who can like uh, compose thoughts in a coherent fashion and put it together over a novel, especially, uh, particularly people who are making up a world from scratch have always fascinated me because I think that that is a special type of genius. Like, uh, like case in point, um, I know she's canceled now. I know she's canceled. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that in advance. Now I'm what you're going to say. But, you know, she was an influential part of my childhood. You know, J.K. Rowling, right? And it's not so much the Harry Potter stuff. I mean, I mean, that's cool that she came up with Harry Potter. But let's talk about how within Harry Potter, she came up with a sport that doesn't exist with coherent rules that make sense and like structured it. All which made sense within the world she had created. I'm like, what? Pure genius. I, yeah. That's, that's a, that is a level of imagination in detail. And to be able to articulate that, like you said, that's just, yeah. And that's that's what I love about I love that about the imagination and the more that we visit with with our inner world, the more that we can start to get familiar um, and and hopefully share that you know it's it's hard to translate that into formats that that the world can digest, but yeah you know, I think that's why I went into entertainment was the way to for me to 
translate the, the things that I was wrestling with in my, in my heart and mind, the things I was concerned about, the, the injustices of the world, you know, what's going on with the planet. Um, that for me was like, oh, wow, entertainment. That's where everybody is. That's where folks are at. Right. So let's try and reach them where they're at. And, and it might not be that we get the Harry Potter mega hit of the universe, but we, we got to try. Not not only that. Look for the for the, all the revisionaries that are out there listening. I will say that if you've ever had any creative inclination at all, I encourage you to pursue it because even if you have an idea that you think is super weird and no one will like, there's like what three point eight billion people on this planet, probably more. I don't know. I've never counted myself. Um, but seven? No, seven. What do they say? Seven point eight billion. I haven't. No, I think point is, you had there are a lot of people here. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of people on this planet. Meaning, if you have one weird idea, statistically, someone else will enjoy your ideas and your thoughts. And, you know, even if you touch one person, you know, that's someone's life that you made a difference in. So if you have any creative inclinations, go ahead, pursue it, put it out, be weird. Who cares if it's stupid? Who cares if it sucks? Just get it out and put it into the universe. And that's my soapbox for the day. That's what's up, though. I, I love that. I wish more people could, would say that and, and or hear that because there would be it would be a, it would be a much more fulfilling world. I think, you know, if we if we felt like, oh, yeah, what I have to say, you know, actually matters. And and it does. I really believe that. I think everyone has has some important perspective to share. Unless it's hate speech, keep that stuff to yourselves. We don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless it's Q and on seven. You can revision revisionary that one. <laughs> All right. Before we go too far down this rabbit hole, Aaron, uh, let's get to the, the fun part. Uh, Aaron, the stage is yours. Go ahead and tell us your story. I was twelve. Am free. But I got sucker punched by a neo-Nazi who didn't even let me get my boxing gloves on before getting all Rocky Marciano on me. And so all of his friends laughed. I held a near broken jaw. I was completely, completely silenced. I felt like crying dry tears and yelling in silence. Um... Luckily, I, I lived not too far from, uh, from a library. And as I was walking home from my friend's house where this all went down, I should, say, I should preface that these were friends that I thought I knew. And I was, you know, I was thir- just about to be 13. It was a very awkward time coming into puberty. And I just didn't really understand... Uh, these were mostly older kids that I was kicking it with, and I think they liked me because I could do uh, I could do kick flips with my skateboard. Nobody else could do that at the time. I don't even know exactly. We didn't. Yeah, as I look back, I'm not exactly sure why we were hanging out. Um, I was Jewish. They were the younger brothers of the literally of the the local neo Nazi group. Um, and I, I didn't realize any of that at the time, but I didn't even know that, that, uh, yeah. Anyway, this is a real fall from grace moment for me. And I realized when they shouted, actually they shouted at me as I left and they, you know, they said some things, uh, hate, hate speech. Yeah. I mean, actually facts and, and I just was crying, but I didn't even know what it was like weird. Because, you know, you think you have a friend and they do something like that to you. And it's just so devastating. Anyway, on my way home, literally just devastated, I um, I arrived at the library. And I don't know why, but I went in there because it I wasn't ready to face my parents yet. I didn't feel like I was ready to do that. And I went to the, the silence of the library. And I started just kind of sitting with the books and I don't know it was it was like there was image I remember images of all these holy figures you know but yeah the library is kind of a holy place people don't often think of it that way but there was the Dalai Lama and Nelson Mandela and you know like real heroes of the of of the world 
And I think I found this solace in the, the world of imagination of, yeah, it was like the perfect place I could have gone, even though I was still in, in so, so much pain. Um, and I just really was like in this complete post-traumatic state. Um, and anyway, yeah, I, I just had kind of a mystical moment in the library, actually. And as I left the library, went home, and I shared with my parents what, uh, well, actually, no, I shared with my mom. I was scared to share with my dad. I, I wasn't really ready to tell him that I had, like, that I had actually been hurt and hurt in this way. And the fact also that that they had proposed this as a boxing match and didn't even let me get my gloves on. And I didn't even, by the way, I did not even know what boxing was. Right. Like in the way that it was, I don't know. It was, it was all so strange as I'm really kind of like unraveling it in my mind now. It was just bizarre. So let me ask you something while, while you're here. So you, maybe I, I'm, I don't know if I missed this when you were telling it, right? Were you in a place where boxing normally happened that you had gloves with you? So that's the weird thing. No, we were. So thank you for. Yeah, I didn't set the stage properly. So I was actually in um, in my friend's living room and there was a bunch of there was a it was basically a bunch of boys in a circle, probably eight other boys Mm -hmm. and no parents were around. And all of a sudden it was like, hey, there's boxing gloves and Aaron wants to fight. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't know what that was, but <laughs> sure. really seriously, they, they sucker punched me before. And it was such a, it was like three really intense punches to the dome. So also for, uh, for the revisionaries that are listening, could you uh, please explain um, why the neo-Nazis would want to hit you in particular? Well, dang. Uh, yeah. So Jews and Nazis don't have the most advantageous history. Sure. And in fact, my family was, you know, part of my family was in the Holocaust. And, uh-huh. um, and I don't know to what extent uh, that was perceived by those mm-hmm. perceived friends at the time. Um, but... What do they say? History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. I've never heard that. So that's that's kind of how I like how right. I reflected on this experience because it was the first time I ever ex- really experienced anti-Semitism. Okay. And um, and it was it was really rough. It took me uh, months and months to to even. I mean, I mentioned it to my mom, and she was just she didn't really know how to process it other than just hug me and say, you know, I'm sorry. I love you. That's not who you, you know, you you don't have to uh, let that experience. I don't remember exactly how she said it, but she said that that is not the whole of you at all. And, you you know, she kind of gave me this reminder that, that I'm just, I'm light. I'm, I'm like, I'm light and love. I'm God. I'm not like, that's not the fact that, that people are targeted for how they look or for, you know, our last names or for any of, of these, these societal judgments. Um, I think, you know, during the Trump years, we obviously saw this play out in all sorts of different ways, but argue, you know, it's, it's a part of the history of this country with, and, and the crazy thing is like, I started to learn like it was a catalyst for me to learn about all of these different historical perspectives on, um, you know, on, on hate, on, uh, discrimination. I mean, I think discrimination is probably a more nuanced way of saying what had happened. Um, but the crazy thing was, so to finish the story that, uh, or at least to, to advance it to, to the, the experience uh, that I had. In, so a year and a quarter later, I, I, by the way, I just like basically boycotted them. I never, I didn't ever confront them. I didn't go to retaliate. I wasn't 
trying to be clever and like teach them a lesson after. Um, but I just, yeah, I basically just didn't, I, you know, I, le- I left that friend group. And right. yet a year and a, a quarter later, I think it was, we were back in a, um, we were, at, it was like some house party and I mm-hmm. didn't know they were, that I didn't know that. So the two culprits, I didn't know that they were going to be there. Turns out they were there and we ended up um, seeing each other and had a confrontation where I was like, I basically stepped to them. I don't, you know, I was a little bit more confident at that point. And I was, you know, I, I came up to them and I say, you know, what you did was, was horrible. And I never forgot that. And I probably won't ever forget this. And, and I won't forget that. And I said, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to resort to your, I'm not going to come down to your level and hate you back. I just want you to know that, you know, I hope that you can find love in your heart and that folks can love you. And it was like this weird, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about it. It was just something that my, my family kind of instilled in me was like, we don't hate back the people that hate us. That's just mm-hmm. not going to work it out. So, okay. So let's back up here. Uh, first off, um, I believe you said you were 12 when this happened. Yeah. Just, just about to turn 13. You might've been the most mature 12 year old ever because <laughs> that is not how I would have reacted at the age of 12. You know what I mean? Like, were you raised on C-SPAN? Cause I'm just trying to figure out <laughs> why you were so wise. <laughs> uh, I was, I was, I was, I was small. Right. So I didn't have, I didn't have like the ability to exert my physical prowess to like really, you know, go out, go at these folks and fight them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I felt like, I think I had to use my intellect and I had to use my, my, I don't know my, but, but yeah, I was, I was a little different. I wasn't like, um, I don't know. I think even in my rebellious teenage years, it, it, I was I was always like still had a book tucked in in my back pocket or something like I was mm-hmm. always just like thinking about the world and trying to find fairness and maybe that's because I'm a Libra or something I don't know um, but just the combination of factors of how I was raised and I think my parents really you know they really um, did a lot of work to make sure that I was it, do, doing my best I'm not right. I made plenty of mistakes like everybody else trust me. But, um, but I was, you know, I really, uh, I think I I really wanted to do right. Something else that I I wanted to touch on, because you mentioned that you ran home, but you didn't want to show your parents that, uh, that you were hurt, right? Where, um, how did they know? Like, did you, because I, I, did you like break down or was there a physical mark? How did they? I I tried to, I tried to, I mean, I, I actually never. I told my dad years later, it took me years to tell him. And I, and I kind of like judged it with my, I, I really undercut it with my mother. I didn't actually tell her the full scope. So I see. Uh, yeah, basically it ended up being in this, you know, in this embarrassing state around, around it, you know, not, not knowing how to process um, your that feeling level of emotion. So now, were you more trying to protect them from the reality or were you trying to protect, I guess, yourself from having to relive it through that conversation, very difficult conversation? Oh, that's interesting. I think it was a little bit of both because I actually did have shame and, uh, and uh, I, like I said, this post-traumatic uh, just the numbing that can happen. Like when, yeah, when something really crazy happens or painful, yeah, the, there's something that the body does, the somatics that wants to just either shove it down or forget it or, I don't know, it's interesting, it's a good question. But I think it was a little bit of both where I didn't want to, you know, I was, I was embarrassed even though it wasn't my fault, but mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, and and... Um, and then in, you know, in, in a weird way, I remember, you know, just kind of like asking my mom to keep it on the hush, 
you know like just asking her like hey i don't i don't really like yeah so it's interesting it's definitely and i i wonder now if i were to interview my mom about it what she would say about that moment too you know put yourself in their shoes for a second right do you think they fully understood the impact of what they were doing or were they just being 13 year old kids? And I'm not saying this to defend them. I'm just curious on your, you know, thoughts. No, I don't know. I, I mean, and there was a couple of like 14 and 15 year olds in the room. So I think the older kids probably egged it on. I don't know. I don't know. It was basically like, it felt like a setup. So mm-hmm. it didn't feel like there was a little bit of premeditation around sure. what had happened. But I don't really, I don't know. I would like to think that they were a little bit more ignorant than it, it, it yeah, than, than at least the way I processed it in the long run, you know. But but I don't know, man. It's It's difficult because there's this there's there's this thing that you know when somebody does something wrong you don't want to i don't believe in punitive response i think that that actually makes things worse um and there's there are in a lot of traditional societies if somebody's really acting out in whack and terrible ways that we actually put them in the center of the room or we try and really like face them and have you know have it out to try and figure out more constructive ways of supporting them because obviously what what that saying is like they're not being heard or they're they're in pain so they want to inflict pain on others essentially that's kind of like my perception of it that hurt people hurt people okay so now i'm gonna go ahead and i'm gonna flip this back to you um, Aaron, the stage is yours again. Go ahead and uh, retell us your story. Okay. So there I was in my friend's living room with a group of seven, eight other boys, 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds, just, uh, yeah, just having a, a fun moment as. As, uh, as teenagers and out of nowhere um, the one of the, one of the kids um, suggests hey let's let's have a let's have a a, a rap battle mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know and Aaron see if you could see if you could battle rap me and because you know i think you're i think you're kind of whack or i don't know like says said something to me i can't exactly remember what it was but basically calling me out for for looking and and being different from the rest of the group right and and i said okay so where's the mics at drop the beat you know and so the beat just starts dropping and you know, he starts uh, starts rapping, and um, yeah, it's just it's a it's not a it's not a great uh, not really not really great rhyming scheme, not really great rhythm, just saying a lot of a lot of garbage at me, um, not even great similes, no great metaphors, <laughs> not even a good voice. Yeah. And, uh, but he's saying really nasty things to me and all of his friends are kind of laughing at more of the crude, crude parts of it. Um, and so that, yeah, then I just come right back at him and I get my, my time and my time to shine. And I'm just line by line. I'm just dropping knowledge and science and history and intelligence and, and also just you know, really going, going in on him. And it's just, it's all the things that I've said in my head after the rap battles normally happen, you know, right. like the times that when you're like, Oh, I should have said that. 
But it's literally a string of all of those moments of you know perfect, uh, perfect execution, and I just I just destroy them, and I don't even know how I came up with all that because I wasn't even a rapper quite quite yet. <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> I just you know it was just a miracle as to how I was able to to uh, to face this this verbal attack with so much ease and um, and actually yeah I I, I managed to avert a, a physical altercation and win the respect of this community of these friends not community but just these these group of, of boys and or I didn't even really care what they thought in the end you know that I was able to just move on and and um, and that so that that was the story of the the rap battle with the local neo-nazi group when I turned uh just about to turn 13. <laughs> so hold on. Let me let me ask you this. Why did you uh, pick a rap battle in particular? What inspired that choice? Oh, um, well, be, okay. So I've shared this story before and I've kind of, it's interesting because I have wanted to, I've wanted to take this out of, uh, out of just like the brute, physical like the normal way sure. we express our violence and turn it into something creative and and a little bit and i and i want that for more communities to debate and it might not be a obviously whatever i love i just love rap um right and i think that's a great way to to resolve our anger it's a non i mean it still is you know even though some some rap battles i will say are are um are, are pretty destructive. I've been a part of, of some pretty nasty rap battles. Uh, not that I've ever been exactly a rap, uh, a, you know, battle rapper myself, but I don't know, man, the way you're describing this, I'm imagining you in the crowd, you know, hoodie down, you know what I'm saying? You're bopping back and forth, getting ready to drop bars. <laughs> that's, it. that's, that's what I, I, I just kind of had that picture in my head. And, um, and to some extent, like, you know, I was already trialing some of that in real life anyway at the time. It just wasn't quite as I, I knew I wanted to be a poet. I knew I wanted to be in, I loved music. I thought it was, you know, I love breakdance, just that whole world of like, let's create instead of hate, you know what I mean? And that that's a really so I was already I mean, it's already kind of there. So in a way, it's like a revision on the truth in a mm-hmm. of, of right, right, right. Some of what was already happening for me, at least in my head. And, and, um, I remember like the ending part of that story of when I came back and met them again, a year and a half later, there was kind of like a rap battle esque feeling to that. Okay. That with everyone crowded around us and they were like, Oh, is this going to be like another fight? Let's fight, fight. They were, it was kind of like that moment of let's all, right. You know, like, see another fight um and and i i used the gift of gab as as a way to to combat i like i it was a matter of life or death for me because i i didn't have the physical prowess right to be able to fight him and i don't even know if i was was taught to want to fight but yeah so i now i'm going going back to the the original story but yeah i think rap battles are are amazing and breakdance battles and you know um i just love that that is that whole world of hip-hop no look and i totally get that let me ask you something else one of the things that you mentioned when you were retelling the story is how you know it's at least it's it came across as if you had thought about this for years and you're like okay i should have said this i should have said this i should have said this so now i'm gonna ask you if would you be willing to share one of the things that you wish you had said in that moment you mean in rhyme? No, it, however you oh, want to share it. <laughs> oh, yeah. What I would have said in that moment. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I And and not, not necessarily to, to even bring it in. I mean, I could, yeah, I could, I could spit something around it. But I think, I think really getting to the heart of it and just being vulnerable, it's that you know, my, my differences from you, um, or the, the things that, that, that we perceive as different about one another are not a problem. 
that's not that's not i mean that's the heart of the message of what i'm resting right and i probably would have said that in age appropriate ways you know what i mean like i would have said that in a very different way at that time but um and it's hard for me to exactly articulate what those words would have been but something about like i don't know i think we all just want to be like I want to be accepted for who I am. I accept you for who you are. You're not, you know, you're not always like, uh, and, 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 and I thought, I thought that person was my friend, you know, friends don't turn on one another just because we're different or because the crowd says, oh no, he's not cool. You know what I mean? Right. In the moment like that, that's whack. That's not real friendship. So I think that was a that was kind of a, a deep moment for me where, like I said, it was a it was a just this this recognition that our differences are not that different unless we we believe in them, you know, mm-hmm. unless we really put energy into those and you know, yeah, I guess whatever whatever we want to see is what is what will what will be shown to us. You know, they, they, what is it that um, another another good one is that uh, yeah, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So for me, like the way that I see so many people when they perceive difference, yeah, we're different, and diversity is beautiful, and that should also be celebrated even more than sought to like pull us apart, right. But you know what I mean? Like the fact that so many of us are targeted for looking different, being different, talking different, whatever it is, it's just ridiculous because, yeah, we all bleed red. We're all part of the five fingered clan. You know what I mean? So I think that's kind of what I would have got at in that in an age appropriate way. So it's, right. it's hard to exactly give you the vocabulary. So. A few things here. First off, I've never heard the term Five Finger Clan. I was like, I don't know. Is this a stealing seminar? Like, I don't know what's going on here. That's number one. Um, number two, Did again. a healing seminar? No, no. Definitely said stealing. Oh. Uh, stealing. <laughs> you know, definitely said stealing. We we don't heal. <laughs> oh, so funny. Um, you should be a so, comedian, by the way. Who, me? Yeah, you know what? I thought about it. Yeah, you, you, you might have a future in that. <laughs> If you, if you know someone who can put me on, you let me know, all right? I, I, uh, yeah, definitely. So, you know, and also, you know, Aaron has inspired me. I'm sliding him my mixtape as soon as we're done. It's <laughs> going to be now. I'm going to be now on Carlos Music. That's what I'll be. You heard it here first. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's hilarious. I'm flip, having flip way too much whole, fun. Yeah, that's what? you flipped the whole five finger, the five finger discount. That's, that's probably where you were thinking of it. Yeah. Yep. No, that's 100% where it came from. That's great. Yeah, I thought of that on the spot, too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I want to say, first and foremost, I want to say, Aaron, thank you very much for coming on to the Revisionary Podcast. Um, I appreciate you opening up and having, you know, this conversation with our revisionaries. Mm, it's been, a, it's been a awesome experience. And I love that. I love the notions. What you're presenting is just deep. It's, it's really, I love the, the notion that we can reimagine our, our past. I like, so, uh, on a more serious note, I, I like to think, and I've said this before on the podcast, that I think we're all part of one shared human experience. So I think it's important to have these conversations, uh, so, you know, whether it's a silly conversation or a serious conversation, I think there's validity in all of them in that, you know, you might not have had the opportunity to change your specific situation, but someone else might be listening to this, be in a similar situation and go, you know what? Aaron said that this is what he would have done differently. You know, and have the foresight to do it in that moment, and that could have deep, long-lasting impact. Mm. That's that's awesome because each moment we have those choices of how we of how we act. It's not always that we get to choose what happens to us, right? But we right. get to choose how we respond, and and um, and I just would have loved. I would have. Yeah, I would have loved to remain friends with those people and uh, and not have this traumatic experience that I still have to talk about 30 years later or whatever, 20. Now I'm dating myself. 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I you heard it here first. He's applying for AARP next week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, be, before I let you go, we have two traditions on this podcast. Um, the first is we like to highlight a charity or an organization or some sort of cause at the end of every episode. Do you have one that you'd like to share with us? Yes, I wanted to uh, shout out the Solutions Project, which is um, just an amazing organization that's doing work to help the United States shift to uh, what they call a just transformation to a sustainable, equitable, clean energy economy, and really by centering communities that have suffered disproportionately from dirty energy and from climate change. So, yeah, um, centering Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian, other communities of color, poor communities that are on the front lines um, of, of the climate crisis. And, and that, yeah, that, that we can get behind those kind of organizations that are literally helping, uh, you know, at the biggest scale shift toward a more just and sustainable world. I think that, I think that's beautiful. Um, I was going to make a joke, but you know what? (laughs) I think, no, no, I think this is so important that I want to just let it like Mm. marinate and let people uh, hear the message and definitely go out and encourage them to support. Um, But the second tradition that we have on this podcast is uh, we like to ask our guests to share a quick uh, childhood story that puts a smile on their face or generally makes them feel warm inside when they think about it. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, when I, when I was a kid, so I was, I was raised on a small farm and we grew the most incredible peaches that you ever tasted in your whole life. Father's a amazing farmer and um yeah just the most delicious peaches and i swear to swear to god that i knew i could he i was so in tune with those trees because i love those peaches so much that i could i knew when the first one was going to get get ripe and i could let i could go right to that tree and to the right peach and i was always the first one that could get to w- when the peaches started ripening. And so that first peach out of the whole crop would kind of be ceremoniously shared with my family. Um, and I just, I, yeah, I don't know if it was always shared in that way, but I remember a couple of times just that, yeah, the, that first peach of the year was, uh, was a big deal for, for us farming folk out there. Wow, thank you for sharing that. I because I think that is a uh, very different from my environment growing up in a big city. So that's cool that you, <laughs> you know, had those experiences. I gotta ask though, um, and you can decline to share if you want, but you know, given uh, for those of you guys who are listening, you you grew up in Michael Douglas's house for a little, or you were born there. Is that what it was? I was I was born in Michael Douglas's basement. Yeah, I'm, yep. Gotcha. I was gonna ask if you had any stories from from oh, like. That, th- uh, well, by way of my parents only, but my, uh, oh, just the, the, because people are always like, what, what is that? Like, I don't understand. But yeah, my, my mother was cooking for him. My mother and my father was the, the head gardener, uh, for the Douglas estate. And we happened to live in their basement, which, uh, and they they had uh, planned to have a home birth, and that just happened to be where they were living. So I was born in the basement. Um, apparently, he actually helped name me, and um, yeah, I, you know, I, I kind of grew up in this awkward balance between the fame and affluence of of Hollywood celebrity and working class parents who were activists, and so I think. Um, that was a it was a funny way to come into the world, but uh, yeah, I wish I could actually get in touch with them and share with them all of my amazing film and TV ideas. You you know all you have to do is uh, add him at Instagram, tweet at him, you know, add him on TikTok, you know, send him a smoke signal. I'm sure one of those. Wait, let me realize. You know, fax him. I think faxing is probably the most efficient way to get to him. Yeah, yeah, or uh, <laughs> carrier pigeon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
I can't believe. Wait, is that what people mean when they say facts? The the. <laughs> um. So funny you say that. Uh, they don't, but they did during that Amarion song. So that's that. That is. We're gonna bridge that whole connection. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? You should send fan mail. I don't think anyone uses snail mail anymore. So you know, your letter might be the only one that actually arrives. Good point. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you up on that. <laughs> Good. Um, I want two percent of the profits for having the idea. See, yeah, it's very it, cheap. I'm, I'm gonna. You'll be, you'll be casted as the star and and lead writer. You know, you shouldn't joke about stuff like that. It is my dream. Let's, you know, to, let's go. To... <laughs> but, it's the time of uh, it's the time of the storyteller, and every, yeah, everyone's got a story to tell. And you, you, you got you helped me reimagine my story, so that's dope. Nah, I mean, I want to say thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you doing this. Um, before I let you go, do you have any last words for our revisionaries? Oof, I guess just just to do do your best every day. Um, have as much fun as possible and and every you know in everything bring that kind of joy because i don't yeah i I guess when i when i think about the fact that none of us know if we're going to be here tomorrow just try and live it live it up as best we can each day you know and and do our best that's beautifully said well one last thing sorry before i let you go where can the people where can the revisionaries follow you Oh yeah, you can just at Aaron Abelman on all the socials. But uh, my website, AaronAbelman dot com. Please tune into the Welcome to Earth book. Yeah, follow me. Check check in with me. Hit me up. Let's build. Let's do it. On that note, I'm gonna let you go and say thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. Thank you so much. Peace. The Revisionary Podcast. So <laughs> that look, here's the cool thing about it, right? It's interesting when you speak to someone from a different perspective, and I think that Aaron was just a completely uh different person than the people I'm used to, and I really like that about him, you know, he was all like not all over the place, but you know what I mean? Like he just has a completely different life experience than than I did. And I think it's cool that, you know, that he does the music and I I even thought the way he retold that story was kind of interesting, you know. Um, you know, he, he could have taken a different path, but he, he, he still wanted to go head on and, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think that that's kind of cool. I have a lot of respect for him and, uh, and I want to thank him for uh, joining us on the podcast without uh, further ado. I would like to announce that, uh, you guys have been nominated for uh, the best podcast audience. So, uh, congratulations. You guys are the best. And as always, I want to say thank you for listening. This is the.